This podcast is for general informational educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of PHM from Pittsburgh. I am still your host, Dr. Tony Tarcici. I'm a MedPeds trained pediatric hospitalist here at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. We are coming to you today to discuss the long awaited, long overdue, but highly anticipated evaluation and management of well appearing febrile infants, 8 to 60 days old the clinical practice guideline from the AAP. Uh, it's going to be the entire topic today. It was just published in August of 2021. Uh, first author was Robert Pantel. Last author was Char- Dr. Charles Woods with the Subcommittee on Febrile Infants. Uh, this was a, I'm not going to lie to you, also a tough guideline for me to get through. Uh, there was a lot in it, and there was a lot of great information, and there was some stuff that I had not seen before in a guideline. So I needed to get some guests on that could really help us figure this out. And I was very fortunate and very lucky to get two wonderful guests. We'll introduce them now. Uh, Our first guest is Dr. Sonia Desai. Dr. Desai is an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Washington and a hospitalist uh, at Seattle Children's Hospital. Dr. Desai's medical training has traversed the country. She obtained her medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis, completed her pediatric residency at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, She then completed her PHM fellowship at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. During fellowship, she participated in Dr. Aronson's multi-center febrile young infant collaborative and led a sub-study examining duration of antibiotic therapy among infants with bacteremic UTIs. She also served on the committee that developed the Cincinnati Children's Clinical Practice Guideline for Febrile Infants in 2019 and led a local QI initiative aimed at safety shortening hospital stays in these infants. Clinically, Dr. Desai practices in both the academic and the community settings, and her research interests focus on improving the quality of pediatric care provided outside children's hospitals. She's she's also mother to a rambunctious three-year-old who is home with a cold and currently getting an hour of screen time to allow for the recording of the podcast. So, Uh, Asanya, thank you for coming on and thank you for screen time. (laughs) Thank you for having me and please let me know if you hear Peppa Pig in the background. (laughs) (laughs) Got it. Our second guest, we have two, is uh, Dr. Paul Aronson. Uh, Dr. Aronson is an associate professor of pediatrics and of emergency medicine in the section of pediatric emergency medicine at Yale School of Medicine. After a brief foray in the arts as a drama major at Duke University, Dr. Aronson received his medical degree at NYU School of Medicine, where he again dabbled in the arts by joining the first medical school improvisational comedy troupe. He completed his pediatric residency, chief residency, and pediatric emergency medicine fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia before joining the faculty at Yale School of Medicine. He serves as a deputy director of the pediatric residency program, His primary area of research is the evaluation and management of the febrile young infant, and he is the principal investigator of the Febrile Young Infant Research Collaborative. He also focuses on the development and testing of interventions to facilitate shared decision-making in the emergency department. His primary job, however, is to be father to his two children and specifically a hockey, softball, and tennis parent. Uh, from one former tennis parent to another, Paul, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. So uh, we have to let's do our conflict of interest disclosures first, get them out of the way. I will go first, kick it out to you, Sonia, then kick it out to you, Paul. Uh, I have nothing uh, of relevance to disclose related to this podcast. Okay, Paul, give us your uh, disclosure and we'll hit Sonia for hers. I have no conflicts of interest or disclosures. I have received funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Sonia, you're up. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Okay. So the way I thought we would start, we're going to go through first who the guideline is for, and I'm going to ask and just shoot some questions out along the way, and we're going to have our wonderful guest kind of help us out. So to understand the guideline first, you got to know who it was intended for. And so first it was this term infants who are well-appearing, aged 8 days to 60 days of age, 
with a fever greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius. So right off the bat, can we talk about why infants from one to seven days of life were not included in this guideline? So the reason the infants in the first week of life were included is that those infants are at high risk for early onset sepsis, primarily due to uh, group B streptococcus or GBS. Um, and so I think those infants are inherently high risk. Um, and so we're just considered a separate population, uh, both in this guideline and in some of the prior studies. I would say from a clinical practice standpoint, an infant in the first week of life who presents with a fever to the outpatient or emergency department or inpatient setting should be managed really similar to the 8 to 21 day old infants in that they are high risk, they should receive the full workup, including lumbar puncture, and be admitted on intravenous antibiotics. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Yeah, they, they talked a little about that. It was nice to get that all out. Now, one of the things they talked about initially is they changed terminology for these guidelines. So I am used to, growing up in pediatrics, uh, SBI, serious bacterial infection, or where I trained, it was rule out sepsis, which I learned was not the right term. So they got rid of the term SBI because they felt UTI is so much more common. They purely addressed or tried to the evidence for bacterial meningitis and bacteremia, and they replaced SBI with a term IBI, or invasive bacterial infection. They talk about this for a while. They really wanted to really stress that they wanted to remove UTI from this rule, this workup for these febrile infants to really focus on the more invasive things. Uh, is did I get that right, Sonia? Did I did I Explain that well. It, it was that kind of what they did and why from how you understood it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Rochester guidelines, the Philadelphia guidelines, and the Boston guidelines um, were all um, aimed at detecting SBI, um, which is serious bacterial infections, and that included UTI, bacteremia, and meningitis. But most of those infections were UTI. So um, in the population of zero to 60 days, we think close to about 10% of infants will have a UTI. 1% to 2% will have bacteremia, and 0.5% to 1% will have meningitis. Um, and so when you think about these three distinct conditions, their outcomes are actually quite different. And we know that infants with UTI do relatively well. Um, and then the risks of adverse outcomes increase with bacteremia and then more so for meningitis. So when we're trying to determine which infants do we want to perform invasive testing on, um, you really want to focus it on the on the diseases in which there is a higher risk of adverse outcomes. And so that's why most of the emerging literature in the last, I would say, five years has focused on bacteremia and meningitis. The hard thing with that is that these outcomes are now rarer. And so in order to power your studies, you, en you end up needing to enroll a lot more infants. Yeah, they mentioned for meningitis, out of somewhere approximately 25,000 febrile infants, there was like 64 cases of men in bacterial meningitis. So these numbers are really small. But so let's get into a little bit on who was on the committee and the overall structure of how they did this. I think that's important for people to know because we don't like to accept anything on face value. We want to kind of know who did it and why. So who was on the panel? They had an epidemiologist, general pediatricians, pediatric subspecialists, including pediatric emergency medicine, pediatric hospital medicine, pediatric infectious disease, and family medicine. And then the layers that go into making a guideline, I found were actually somewhat interesting to me. I don't know if our audience will agree or not, but so there were four meeting, four meetings for those on the committee. They had access to the AHRQ evidence review conducted by the U.S. and selected international countries. There was a supplemental review and analysis performed by the epidemiologist assigned to the committee. They got copies of all published literature cited in the reports. And if there were gaps in the literature, data was solicited and received from authors of previously published peer-reviewed articles who performed additional analyses from their investigations. And then after they formulated a set of recommendations, there was further consideration by the American Academy of Pediatric Sections and Committees, external organizations, physician reviewers, and parents, as well as focus groups of pediatricians from general practice, pediatric hospital medicine, PGM, Peds critical care, and Peds infectious disease. So clearly they focused on developing a guideline to improve the diagnosis and treatment of, of what we just talked about. They used the regular AAP rating of evidence and recommendations that we're used to. Level A is strong, evidence-based. Level D is weak, evidence, just 
expert um, recommendations. And then the guideline talks about, let's talk about the inclusion and exclusion criteria, because this I found fascinating. There are huge exclusion criteria. So they wanted to look at febrile infants who are well-appearing. Then they get into a lot of, it's very hard to come up with an evidence-based approach to assess well-appearing versus uh, not well-appearing. And there have, there have been numerous attempts, and they have not worked out. And so they understand that that in and of itself is subject to experience. If you've seen, if you've been doing this a long time, and the, you'll you'll be able to have an assessment of this. Did I, uh, Paul, did I pretty much sum that up correctly in terms of how they felt about it? Yes, I think when we think about clinical appearance, I mean, there's been a couple of studies, both um, some studies from Doug Baker a number of years ago, and then more recently uh, by uh, P. Karn, led by uh, Lise Nigrovich, Nate Cooperman, Prashant Mahajan, who looked at sort of the Yale observation scale, which works well in infants over, uh, children over two months of age, um, and then even just cl- clinician suspicion. And, and the sort of bottom line is that infants who are ill appearing certainly have a higher risk, but that is, the, it's a poorly reliable finding amongst clinicians. And, in, and there are a substantial number of infants who are well-appearing who still have a risk of IBI. But I think their thought was that if an infant's clearly ill-appearing, if someone thinks they're ill-appearing, those infants need the you know sort of full court press in terms of the, of the workup. I think we all all agree on that, even though there is some um, sort of interrelated a lot interrelated reliability issues with that. So that's why they they took they took those infants out, but recognizing that the sort of well appearance or ill appearance is in the eye of the beholder, both in terms of training, in terms of experience. Uh, and so clinicians sort of need to apply sort of their own judgment in terms of in terms of that uh, and applying the guideline. So then really you're saying that they wanted if an infant came in with a fever and looked toxic, looked ill they want them out of this guideline, do everything they have to do for the infant, forget about the guideline, and just take that approach. That was kind of the purpose of making well-appearing such an important part of this. Yes. All right. Who's eligible for the guideline? So infants who are, we talked about well-appearing, have a documented re- rectal temp of greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit at home in the past 24 hours or as determined in a clinical setting, had a gestational age between greater than or equal to 37 weeks and less than 42 weeks, 8 to 60 days of age and home after discharge from a newborn nursery or born at home, which was a surprising. I didn't realize they included them, but that they did. Then the exclusion from the, from the guideline. There is about 10 exclusion criteria. So first, premature infants less than 37 weeks to station. Then um, an infant under two weeks old whose perinatal courses were complicated by maternal fever infection and or antimicrobial use. And I took this to mean antimicrobial use in the patient, not the mother who had the maternal fever, right? You guys both agree with that? Okay. Um, High suspicion of HSV, which we're going to get to. One of the things I did like about this is they go into what the the guideline goes into what seems like tangents, like they go into a whole section on HSV and when to think about it, what makes someone more likely to have an infection, which I actually found very informative. So I'm happy they did it. But and they, and they go into some detail on it. Uh, infants with focal bacterial infection like cellulitis, oomphalitis, septic arthritis, or osteomyelitis, but they exclude otitis media, and they say manage them like you would. Those with clinical bronchiolitis with or without RSV, documented or suspected immunocompromise, neo, neonatal course compl- complicated by surgery or infection, so I'm assuming anyone with like medical neck is is off this guideline. Congenital or chromosomal abnormalities. Here's one of my first questions. But for chromosomal abnormalities, I'm assuming that any child with trisomy 21 is out of this guideline based on that assumption alone. Okay. So they so that so those kids have to work up separately. Medically fragile or requiring technology. Infants who got vaccinations within the last 48 hours because they get into post immunization fever greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius. Is estimated in about 40% of people get vaccines within the first 48 hours post-vaccination. So this is a very thorough, I mean, I have no idea how many children this rules out from who, all who present with fever. But do you have any idea? Is this like only a small fraction, like one, one or two percent? Or is this like including up to 50% of kids who actually present with fever meet the exclusion criteria? Do we know at all? I can take a stab at it. So, Paul, I don't know if you have numbers for this. I couldn't find them. I think when you think about which kids are excluded from this guideline, um, if you look at the Philadelphia and Rochester criteria, 
these children weren't excluded from the guideline, but they were a lot of these kids, so the premature kids, anybody with any sort of pre prior medical condition or, uh, con you know, congenital uh, medical conditions were automatically classified as high risk. Um, so you're right, an otherwise healthy infant with trisomy 21 with a single fever who's 20, you know, 29 days and older may not necessarily need to be automatically classified as high risk, but the older criteria did automatically classify a lot of these infants as high risk. Um, some of the newer, some of the newer studies, such as the PCARN risk prediction rule, did exclude these infants. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason why this guideline excludes these infants rather than automatically classifying a lot of them as high risk. I think it gives clinicians a little bit more leeway in terms of how they might want to treat some of these well-appearing infants that aren't necessarily clinically all that different um, than an infant who might meet the criteria for this guideline. I mean, then I think in terms of numbers, it just really depends on where you're seeing these patients, right? So a tertiary care children's hospital is going to have a different case mix than children presenting to a community site. You're going to get the sicker, um, more preterm, uh, more medically complex children at a tertiary care children's hospital. Depending on the time of year, you're going to either have a lot of children with bronchiolitis or not. So I think the numbers vary, but again, um, I think the guideline is trying to um, remain narrow such that clinicians have the opportunity to exercise judgment to otherwise well-appearing kids rather than treat them all as high risk. And that, that was kind of my interpretation of why they did that. Thank you, Sonia. Paul, anything to add? Yeah, I agree uh, with what uh, Sonia said. I think that the idea is, I think, and then some of the studies, as Sonia mentioned, especially recently, infants who are premature, for example, were excluded. And I think the idea is just to really focus the guide, because as we'll get into, the guideline has a lot of language around clinician judgment, parent values and preferences. And I think that, I think overall the numbers of infants excluded by this guideline isn't it's high, but not too high, meaning that I think I, I can't have a number for it. I would guess it's less than half of infants who we see. But I think it's really taking out the infants who either are just sort of a high risk, kids who are very premature, or kids who, you know, the literature has shown, for instance, children with bronchiolitis, for example, who probably have a, have a lower risk. And just to give clinicians who have the freedom to sort of manage those infants differently and really focus the guideline on the infants who, from a research context, have been the most studied, which is these sort of well appearing, no focal infection, fever without a source full-term infants. And these are the infants who, in, in across studies, have been the most included. And I think that's was, that was uh, the context. It would be interesting to see if, over time, there are more studies on premature infants or on infants with some of these. But I think that the numbers aren't going to be large. So I think it will be hard to sort of modify that. But we'll see if, over time, there's more studies on those infants to better guide decision-making around the infants excluded. Well, I'm glad you brought up the wording of the guidelines, because here's the first place it comes up. So their next section I discuss is infants who may be included. Now, they use those specific words, maybe, and it's one of the first times they do it, but they do this a lot where they really are giving the clinician or the parents or everybody leeway to, do, to include or not include, I guess, based on what you're seeing. But infants who may be included if they have URI but not bronchiolitis, diarrhea, acute otitis media, infants greater than or equal to two weeks who got antibiotics, individualize that response, positive respiratory virus panel, and they get into this a little bit. There's not enough evidence really to recommend for or against respiratory virus panel, but they summarized, the summary was that the risk of invasive bacterial infection in viral positive infants less than 28 days of age are sufficiently high to warrant similar testing and treatment as viral negative infants. But for infants more than or equal to 28 days of life, you could consider using the viral testing to get them out of the regular testing on an individualized basis. And then they discuss cost of this stuff as well. So th they really leave a lot of leeway for the RVP, basically saying the evidence is looking like more than 28 days. It, it's giving you the answer, but we don't know that for certain. And the guideline does that a lot. Is Did I interpret that correctly? Like, is is it basically saying to me as a hospitalist, it depends on how the kid looks in front of me, irrespective of what else is written. Yeah, I think to what you said before and going over the authors and the, uh, I think what's sort of the one of the beauties of the guideline is this is a multidisciplinary guideline. It's meant to apply to infants in the outpatient setting, in the uh, in uh, whether that be rural or urban. It's 
into the emergency department setting and to hospital medicine. We recognize that we are, one, you can argue we are sometimes see a different spectrum of children who I see in the emergency department may be different, who is managed in the office setting, who is managed in the hospital. But we also have different risk tolerance. And I think as you know, we may get into that we're talking overall relatively small risk. I mean, Sonia mentioned this at the beginning, 10% risk of UTI seems pretty high. One to 2% risk of bacteremia, not high, but that's relative to the potential for sepsis and, and bad outcomes if sort of delay in diagnosis. But overall, these percentages are very small. And, and we already know from the literature that infants in the outpatient setting, there's been nice studies from Kaiser, from the PROS network that show the infants are managed differently than in the emergency department. We, we are more, uh, I would say, concerned that we use these algorithms such as the historical low risk criteria more recently, algorithms like the step-by-step approach or the PCARM prediction rule. And so I think what they're basically, I think a lot of that language is to say, it's going to depend on your setting, on, on sort of your own risk tolerance, on, on, on how you practice, what specialty you're in, and, your, and overall. And it gives that sort of leeway because I think that, you know, traditionally what I do in the emergency department is documented to be different than someone who's in the community, uh, in, in a rural area who maybe doesn't have access to a hospital, who knows the family. And, and so I think this gives you that little bit of leeway, depending on the practice setting, uh, to make some of these judgment calls. Thank you, Paul. Sonny, anything to add? Yeah, I think the availability of testing is, is what I'll add too. So, you know, are there places that have uh, rapid respiratory panels that can result in a time such that you can make a decision based on it? Yes. But again, that is limiting to large tertiary care children's hospitals. Most other places, all you can get quickly is a rapid RSV and a rapid flu. So again, I think um, this guideline is being quite inclusive in terms of allowing clinicians to make decisions with the resources they have. So one of the things I'm already noticing is we're 22 minutes in and I have not even gotten to one of the algorithms. And this is the problem with doing this in an hour. So I'm going to kind of speed up what we're doing. uh, And I thank my guests for bearing with me on this one. Uh, So we're going to get into quickly the next section. Uh, We talked about the inclusion exclusion criteria. They go into a lot of the bacteria. E. coli is now the most common organism to cause bacteremia. And it's always number one, number two cause of bacterial meningitis in infants one to 60 days of age. They talk, and they talk about because of the change in bacteriology from improvements in food safety, which decreased listeria to vaccines against strep. And of course, GBS prenatal screening, which we've talked about before. They talk about what Paul brought up, the substantial variability in physician practice with infants with fever, which the numbers surprised me, but there was a 50% in the variability uh, in, in the 50% of the differences in physician practice is totally unexplained. So some of it is infant presentation. Some look m- much, much sicker. Some look amazing. But half of the variability, they have no idea why it's even there, which is a little bit remarkable. So then they get into the inflammatory markers. They talk about that in the beginning before they talk about the flow charts. And they really discuss how white blood cell A and C and band count aren't as helpful as they used to be because E. coli is now replacing GBS as the most common bacterial pathogen, and those things were more were more beneficial with GBS. Then they discuss procalcitonin, which again is expressed by the thyroid C cells, has become a very accurate inflammatory marker for risk stratification, but it's just not available everywhere, kind of like what Sonia just said. So now let's get into my section two. And then the first two pages goes through the history of febrile infant research from the 70s until now. If you're interested, I will leave it to you to read it. Uh, we do not have the ability to cover it. Then they, they talk about that the fact that they created ultimately three separate algorithms for infants with fever. The first is for infants aged 8 to 21 days old. The second is for infants aged 22 to 28 days old. And the third is for infants 29 to 60 days old. We're going to get to them in detail, I promise. All right, so let's dive right in. They have 40 key action statements, and the number is less, but there's like 12 A, B, and C, so total there's 40 of them. So they start with their, and their key action statements are the basically the new guidelines, what they, how they, and they break them up by 8 to 21 days old, 22 to 28 days old, and 29 days old to 60 days old. Okay, so. The first key action statement, should get a UA via cath or suprapubic catheter. Then, if the UA is positive, get a culture. Positive, they state, means any leukocyte esterase on dipstick, more than five white blood cells in a high-power field, in centrifuge urine, or greater than 10 white blood cells per millimeters cubed in an uncentrifuge urine. It then talks about what we've mentioned, that the estimated uh, febrile infant with UTI is about 10%. So 94% of those kids have a positive UA for leukocyte esterase. 
Sensitivity is even higher for UTI with bacteremia, meaning you're more likely to have leukocytesterase on that urine. For if they they bring up a point where if you have a thousand infants, if ten percent of them will have a UTI that's a hundred, of that hundred, ninety four to ninety eight of them will have a positive UA with a positive leukocytesterase, and then two to six of those may be missed. They talk about it being unclear whether those two to six represent a UTI, asymptomatic bacteria, bacteria or contamination which seems to be a theme for this because the UA and the UTI is one of the areas that really changes per age group. Here in the young group, they want a catheterized urine or a superpubic, superpubic aspiration. If it's positive, get a culture. This seemed like one of the major areas they really stressed. Am I right about that? Uh, Paul, we'll start with you, then we'll kick out to Sonia. Yeah, so this is uh, a change, and there's a you know a growing body of literature, and I'll uh, mention Dr. Alan Schroeder uh, from Stanford, who's been um, uh, you know a researcher who's done several uh, studies and on this topic, and the issue is I think as. Uh, PCARN recently uh, showed in a, in a very nice study published in Pediatrics a couple of years ago that the urinalysis is, is highly sensitive uh, for, for detecting UTI and even, as you said, more sensitive for bacteremic UTI. This question comes up is, uh, is the, we have a positive urine culture with, in the absence of inflammation, in the absence of a, of, of a positive urinalysis. Is that a true UTI? And what sort of Alan Schroeder and some of his work has, has shown and others have argued is that this could represent either contamination or asymptomatic bacteria, which means it's not a true infection. There's no inflammation in the urinary tract. And if you just sort of didn't treat it, it would resolve spontaneously. The problem is, I think, and, and I think, you know, so I, as someone like me in the emergency department, we, if we have a positive urine culture, uh, of, for example, like over 100,000 colony forming units of, of E. coli, uh, regardless of your analysis, I'm going to likely treat that as a, as a, um, as a positive, uh, infection. What this guideline is saying is that there is a cost to that. So we, you know, there's a cost of overtreatment. You give antibiotics unnecessarily and the risk to that, um, versus there is this small chance of a false negative. So it tr- truly had a UTI, but had a negative UA. And their argument is that the false positive risk is is greater than the false negative risk in this case. Um, and so what they are recommending is not to even send the urine culture if the UA is negative, because then that takes away that false positive risk. So you're not even, you're not, you're going to take away that risk of having a culture that was not truly an infection. This is going to represent a practice change, certainly for us in the emergency department uh, to do that. And it'll be interesting to see uh, how people implement this particular recommendation because you have to, it means you have to collect the urine in a certain method. You have to not send the culture unless the urinalysis is positive. Uh, but their argument again is that the false positive outweighs the false negative. And we just have to see if that's how that's going to be implemented. In my own practice, this will be a change and I'm going to have to work on uh, adapting to this, to this recommendation. So, and one of the areas here that, I mean, the eight to 21 day old to me is the most straightforward of the three flow charts. But one of the areas when they talk about the discussion that surprised me, and I emailed you guys before this, they review that the AAP guideline uh, about what is a urine co- positive urine culture, greater than 50,000 colony forming units per ml. Then they state that 10,000 colony forming units per ml, if there is fever and pyuria, is now an, an acceptable threshold for diagnosing UTI. I'm going to be very honest with our listeners. I didn't know that. So when I, when I read that, we had a previous episode where this came up as well. I said, that, that, where did they get that from? So I emailed you guys, and you guys uh, sent me, and Paul, you sent me an article, none other by the great uh, Kenneth Ro- Dr. Kenneth Robertson and Dr. Ellen Wald, who are like giants in the field of pediatric infectious disease research and UTI research, who basically laid out in this beautiful format all of the research leading up to this. So to you all, this wasn't a surprise. Uh, Sonia, we'll start with you and kick it out to Paul. Yeah, I, um, I I think I went through something similar to what you described, Tony, when I was working on my bacteremic UTI study during fellowship, because, uh, you know, the AAP guideline for UTI covers infant, infants two months and older, doesn't particularly include this population. And so when we were, def- we were attempting to de- come up with a definition of UTI in this zero to 60 day population, my initial assumption was, well, we would just use what we use in our AP guideline, because why would it be different? Um, but when you look at the literature that studies infants in this group, and that is, you know, the PEMCRC cohort, the PCARN cohort, most of the prior um, large collaborative studies that have looked at infants zero to 60 days old have used 50,000 colony forming units and greater of a single organism in the absence of pi- whether or not you have pyuria. But then if you have fever and you have pyuria, 
including 10,000 CFU and old and above. So over the last 10 years, the, the, the research in, in this population of patients has kind of abided by that definition. So we wouldn't be straying from the research in that definition, but it's interesting because clinically we are, we, we tend not to think of it that way. Um, the other thing that I will add is again, in an attempt to be more inclusive, um, and we ran into this um, within our uh, collaborative, collaborative as well, even looking at 11 children's hospitals, there were a number of labs that did not report colony forming units at 50,000 or above. So they either reported less than 10,000, 10,000 to 100,000 and greater than 100,000. And I think that's also common in a lot of community hospitals. And so again, the, the 50,000 CFU definition becomes less meaningful when you aren't able to, um, when your lab doesn't report that. Um, and so again, I think by adding by necessitating pyuria and using that 10,000 CFU definition, you're unlikely to have too many false positives by, by reducing the colony form unit. And if you're listening and wondering how, I haven't heard this either. I want to read this article. It's in Pediatrics, the one by Dr. Kenneth Roberts and Ellen Wald, uh, February 2018, uh, issue 141. It's called The Diagnosis of UTI. It's a commentary, Colony Count Criteria Revisited. I highly recommend it. We've had Dr. Ellenwald on the show on our uh, Leaders in Medicine pediatric series. It was great. So uh, then we're going to, their, their second key action statement was very straightforward, get a blood culture. The third one is inflammatory markers aren't necessary, but some clinicians may find them helpful, so they're optional. And when I first read this, before I had read the rest of it, I thought that was weird. Why would they tell you to do something that may, probably isn't helpful, but go ahead and do it? And it's to me, it seems like because the other age groups, we use inflammatory markers a lot more, uh, uh, CRP, procalcitonin, and NANC and fever. But uh, I'm assuming that's why they put that there. But it, it's, weak, it's weak evidence for it. Uh, but am, do you think I'm right about that or am I just trying to become a fortune teller too quickly? Yeah, I think to be honest, this is something that, um, you know, in the emergency department, uh, we're so used to, and I'll use just my own practice example of sending inflammatory markers. And I think what the guideline is saying is that really at this age group, if, if you're going to be recommending, which it does, admission on antibiotics, lumbar puncture, observe for culture positivity 24, 36 hours, the inflammatory markers don't help you restratify. And I guess what it's offering is saying, if for some reason someone on the inpatient side it would use those positive inflammatory markers to somehow determine time to discharge, but really the evidence doesn't necessarily support that. So I think what it's trying to do actually is pull back the practice of physicians like myself and saying, why are you saying that inflammatory marker? It's a needless cost, perhaps even a needless stick if you have to stick the infant more than once. Um, it would really, there's not much benefit in this age group if the recommendations and the management is going to be the same. Yeah. I, I, Sonia, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah. I think as a hospitalist, one one area where this um, where these inflammatory markers can be helpful is in an infant where it has been either difficult or uh, difficult to obtain an LP, so you don't have um, the information, or you have a traumatic CSF sample, and then the then you know any subsequent LP attempts are pretreated. And so when you have those infants admitted to your inpatient unit, you have to make a decision about well, am I going to reattempt a lumbar puncture? Am I going to try to get this infant to IR to get a lumbar puncture? Um, it really, I think that's a situation in in this in which in this age group you could maybe make an informed decision about. Um, whether or not um, you're going to go to great lengths to obtain that CSF sample um, once they've been admitted. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that. We always just uh, get our, get IR to do the LPs looking at the white blood cell count because if they've been pretreated, the culture is going to be negative. Um, I wonder if the inflammatory marker evidence will help bear that out as things come. Yeah. And I, and I would say, again, uh, speaking from a community hospitalist perspective, right, when, when getting an IR-guided lumbar puncture would require transfer to another institution. Um, would you use inflammatory markers and perhaps serial inflammatory markers and observation of this infant as kind of uh, kind of a, a an alternative to kind of transfer? And I think again, that's not an area that is borne out in evidence, but I can see it as an area where um, getting these lab tests um, might be useful. That's a great point, and I mean it brings up what we talked about earlier, which is where you're practicing will really dictate what you can or cannot do or will or will not do. And, you know, for me, it's 
a, not even a thought, oh, IR, sure. But for people in a community hospital, that is a challenge to do. You're right. You're absolutely right. So now the fourth key action statement, um, this is the one that talks about HSV a fair bit. We're going to read it first. Clinicians should obtain CSF analysis. Remember, this is 8 to 21 day old. They bring up protein, white blood cell, glucose, and gram stain and culture for bacteria. Then they discuss virus, uh, viruses in the CSF. They talk about the, rate, the rates of HSV specifically. And this, to me, was important because, I don't know, in our ER, Paul, maybe it's the same for you and you, as you work in an ER, we get a lot of kids, or a, it feels like a lot, that come up for rule out where they've sent HSV and they have them on acyclovir. And as the hospital is getting them, I, can't, I may disagree with the fact that they need any of this done. But that's when the guidelines really kind of goes into this, and it's very helpful. The rates of HSV and neonates ranges from 2 to 5 per 100,000, with 15% having fevers as the only symptoms, which also surprised me because you commonly hear if you have HSV meningitis, uh, you're going to be a sick, toxic appearing infant. And here, 15% of them just have fevers. And neonates in these studies, um, the, the ones they referenced were all less than six days of life. And the the well-appearing infant, they said HSV was rare in a well-appearing infant, but it was there. Then they, they discuss what should make you think more about HSV or what should increase the chances of a child having it. First, infants got to be less than 21 days old. If there's vesicles and or seizures, that makes them more likely. CSF pleocytosis and a negative gram stain, leukopenia and thrombocytopenia and hypothermia and mucous membrane ulcers all increase the risk. Maternal history of genital HSV lesions or fever 48 hours before to 48 hours after delivery, and if ALT is elevated. They also recommend enterovirus, and then they mention human paraechovirus as an emerging cause of viral meningitis, and then you can send a multiplex meningoencephalitis PCR panel. But I personally, I don't know how you guys feel, but I personally really like that HSV section because of what we commonly see from our ER. So, so Paul, since I brought you up, I'll let you go first, and then Sonia. Yep, so I think that this is certainly a topic that uh, it has continued research needs. Um, and I think what's been shown in the literature now, both by the PEMCRC as well as the Cincinnati group, uh, amongst others, um, is that, first of all, HSV is very uh, uncommon after 28 days of age, and probably very uncommon after 21 days of age. I think under 21 days of age, we've documented lots of variation, um, still rare, but the outcomes are potentially severe, for especially for disseminated and CNS disease. And so... Um, the Cincinnati, I call it the Cincinnati approach, has been published in a QI project around this, where essentially they uh, assess those risk factors as listed in the guidelines. And if you have these risk factors, you need to go, f- you know, full core in terms of uh, full core press. I'm a basketball fan, so I keep using that analogy. Full core press in terms of comprehensive workup and acyclovir. But if you don't have those risk factors, then you should do a lumbar puncture. And then um, sort of depending on the presence or the absence of CSF pleocytosis, you then send an HSV PCR uh, from the CNS only versus uh, doing a more comprehensive workup if there's uh, sort of concerning CSF or HSV. And what you're trying to do is sort of limit testing to a more targeted high risk group and then limit and then limit testing in sort of infants who are otherwise low risk and, and, and then acyclovir follows. What this showed in their study is that by sort of implementing this guideline at their hospital, they were able to limit testing in, in, in low risk children, target testing better to high risk children, not missing cases of HSV, but then sort of reducing sort of unnecessary testing. Um, the PEMCRC uh, just uh, published a study led by Andrea Cruz, which uh, derived an invasive HSV risk score, which showing needs, it was a retrospective study of case control, and that's a case control study, so it needs prospective validation. But what they had tried to do too is say, if you have these risk factors, it gave, it gave a, a point score to it and saying, if you have none of these risk factors, a lot of the ones listed in the guideline, the, the infant's low risk for more invasive HSV. And if you have higher than a certain score, you become increasingly higher risk. And I think this is another score that I think needs sort of refinement and sort of prospective validation but could for the uh, clinicians to then really limit testing to the more high risk children. Well, that was great. Sonia? Yeah, I think this is going to be a theme of my comments. But again, uh, when you practice in a, in a non-children's hospital setting, HSV testing often takes days to come back. Um, and so if you are hospitalizing every infant under 21 days, um, you're doing, you know, the full cord press approach, and then you're waiting for HSV results. You're actually going to prolong their hospitalization um, by several days, um, often because these are often send out tests. So again, I think the targeted approach that Paul describes makes a lot of sense, um, depending on the resources you have in terms of testing. It's very helpful to have your uh, perspective because you're a, a you're a hospitalist researchers on you who also works in the community hospital setting. That's 50% of the people who work in PHM 
So that's very, very helpful. Now they mentioned the rate of detected pleocytosis, which I was also thought was interesting. It's being, it's about 8.8%, but in the summer it's higher, 17%. And they say that's likely because of enterovirus. And I said, for us, we use pleocytosis. So if we, and you know, as we all know, which they get into, the failure rate of LP is around 20 to 50% in infants younger than 90 days. So what will happen is they'll try to get an LP. If, if unfortunately it's, uh, it's unable to be gotten, then you have a concern, is there a big hematoma? So let's say IR won't be able to go in. Then you have to decide if you get the LP, what is the chance of there being pleocytosis? If there's no pleocytosis and we start antibiotics, we're usually comfortable saying with other factors taken into consideration, the child probably doesn't have meningitis. But here they mentioned detecting enterovirus and CSF can eliminate need for further interventions, which they get into more as the kids get older. And they also remember, remind us that kids, febrile infants who have UTI can also have CSF pleocytosis, but not necessarily have meningitis, whether bacterial HSV, enterovirus, or other viral. So they bring kind of bring that up. And then back to the failure rate of LP. And Paul, I wonder you working in the ER, if you've had this experience, they talk about ultrasound guidance can increase your success rate for LP. Using ultrasound guidance in one study resulted in a 75% success rate after three attempts, which is higher than it was. Yeah, so certainly ultrasound or, you know, uh, uh, POCUS, uh, FOCUS, the different sort of names depending on the use of it, uh, it's sort of becoming more commonly used in the emergency department. Um, I would say I personally uh, do not use ultrasound for lumbar punctures because I'm not as comfortable with landmarks, but there are several um, expert ultrasonographers both in my own section and, and pediatric emergency medicine at Yale as well as uh, nationally who have done research on this and I think really are advocating for perhaps more broad training uh, to then use ultrasound in that practice to increase success rates. So I think, I think it's something that we should sort of more widely implement in off, but it's not sort of gained uh, enough traction yet that it's widely used, but hopefully we'll get there. And we are 45 minutes in, rapidly running out of time. We're not even out of 8 to 21 days old. There's no way we're finishing on time, so I'm apologizing to my guests live here. One of the things they bring up that I think is helpful for people listening, when I was training, we used the red blood cell correction factor whenever there's a traumatic tap, mm -hmm. which uh, the way I trained was 500 red blood cells is one white blood cell, then you correct for it. And they discourage that, the lack of validating studies. Um, so you, they recommend you not use that correction factor. But if you get a traumatic tap, they did say you can test for HSV. That's okay with the traumatic tap. On the key action statement five, remember we have, we have uh, I think I said 40. Uh, clinicians should empirically start antimicrobial therapy. They go into, since the year 2000, infants less than nine days of age, gram-negative organisms, we talked about that. GBS has declined, but is still around 20% of febrile infants with bacteremia after the first week. And in 2013 paper, GBS was the most common pathogen in the second uh, and, and the most common cause of meningitis in 2019 in another paper. So it's still around. And then they discuss if you live somewhere that has ESBL, E. coli, you should use gentamicin instead of ceftazidine for treatment of suspected bacteremia or sepsis and meropenem instead of ceftazidine where bacterial meningitis is suspected. If you want to use a fourth or fifth generation cephalosporin, consider getting ID help. So they talk about ampicillin being good if you're thinking about listeria or GBS as part of your, as part of the organisms, and then obviously ceftaz otherwise. And we're going to skip right through to get some time back here, number six. The one says, if you're just waiting for the culture, you should watch the infant in a hospital setting with nurses who are experienced with infants. The discussion here was more about supporting breastfeeding, good communication with the families, helping them to interpret the data. Then on to seven, this is when you discharge. It's a very similar theme for the rest of the age group. So 24 to 36 hours of negative culture, clinically well-appearing or improving infant, no other reason to be hospitalized. Now, in this discussion, they go into uh, growth time for different bacteria, which I actually kind of enjoyed. 4 to 17% of pathogens takes more than 24 hours to grow. About not, 0 to 9% take more than 36 hours to grow. They said GBS takes 9 to 14 hours, E. coli 11 to 13 hours, Staph aureus 18 to 19 hours. For E. coli, the most common organism to grow, 24% will take longer than 24 hours to grow. Only 5.9% of GBS will grow after 24 hours. Then they even talk about ill-appearing versus not ill-appearing. Well-appearing infants... Uh, are more likely for them to take 24 hours for the bacteria to grow if they're well-appearing. 
about 25% of non-pathogens or what we term as contaminants will grow within the first 24 hours, which was also a pri- surprise. I thought these were more likely to be more than 24 hours, but 25% is a big number. So these numbers were helpful because they explained their 24 to 36 hour point. Am I right about that? Yeah, I can speak to this. Um, this uh, was kind of the basis of uh, the QI intervention we did um, uh, during fellowship to try to reduce length of stay in these infants. And probably the biggest take home point here is for clinicians to really understand the microbiology lab processes of their institution. Um, as time has gone on, most blood cultures are actually have automatic monitoring systems um, such that um, you will know within 30 minutes of, um, of a blood culture being positive. There's an automated system that uses cytometry that can identify pathogens very, very quickly in terms of um, when they are, uh, when when a clinician, when a laboratory tech will know that a blood culture is positive. Um, whereas for CSF, um, these are still kind of done old school at most places. So they're plated um, and then the plates are read every day. So when you're making decisions about discharging an infant at 24 to 36 hours, you really want to know when is this, when has this culture last been looked at? Is there an automated system? Is it a, is it a, um, technician? What time do the technicians look at a CSF culture in the morning? Um, and so I think knowing, understanding the microbiology practices at your institution is, is very key to determining, um, length of observation. That's a great point. Keeping it local. I like that. So now we are wrapping up eight to, to, to this age group, thankfully. So the 7B tells you to treat a positive culture with antibiotics for as long as that particular infection requires, whatever it is. Treat a UTI for as long as UTI shed bacteremia, et cetera. Okay, on to 22 to 28 days old. They discuss the risk of bacteremia and meningitis is lower in infants 22 to 28 days old than it is in 8 to 21 days old. Your risk of bacteria and meningitis Get, get lower the farther out. But in this group, they're higher than in the older infants, 29 and above, which is the reason they have their own category, which I've found helpful because why they got their own category was a mystery until I read that. So here's where the first divide occurs in terms of workup and management. This recommendation is slightly different for 8 to 21 days old, old infants. They say for, for key action statement 8, that here they say we should obtain a UA by cath or suprapubic aspiration and a positive culture. But if we get a UA by a bag, then we have to get a culture by cath or, or, or suprapubic aspirate. So this says you can use the bag as a screen, which I think was that big project out of CHOP, a children's hospital of Philadelphia, their QI study showing they decreased the number of catheterizations in an infant by like 36 to 70 percent, just a gigantic number by doing that. And, and this statement really says that's for this age group is safe. Is that fair? Yep. And there's a, a couple other non-invasive ways to attain urine that have been published in the literature, like the quick wee method, um, the sort of lumbar massage and super tap method that, uh, you know, uh, listeners can, can look up. So there's other sort of clean catch methods to use in addition to bag. Yeah. They mentioned the, uh, the lumbar massage. It's like a, you have to have the, I had, I read about it in this guideline. They bring it up. I couldn't picture how they do it and I can't, I, but it, they said it's very successful. Yeah. And then there's the, the other method is, uh, uh, perhaps more straightforward is infant lying down. You take a, a cold saline, uh, gauze and you sort of rub it on their super pubic area after you've done sterilization. And then you have a cup ready for the urine to pee in both methods of the infant to pee in both, um, you know, methods have been shown, uh, to, uh, sort of reduce, uh, the need for cath and to have very fat, a faster sort of urine output than, you know, just using bag alone. So again, another sort of techniques that, uh, folks can look up. There's some nice pictures and, and articles about these on, on, uh, available. So now key action statement nine is get a blood culture 10. Now here they feel we should assess inflammatory markers. They kind of discuss how fever is not used as much as it should be as an inflammatory marker. They talk about a temperature of 38.5 specifically. They looked at studies and when you combine that with uh, ill appearance at an age less than 25 days, it has a 93.7% sensitivity and a 99.6% negative predictive value. Now, Sonia, this might be a good place to discuss... They use here number, they use number needed to treat a lot. Can you walk us through number needed to treat, uh, for the 22 to 21, 22 to 28 days old 
as we're going to get to it coming up. Yes. Uh, I like number needed to treat as a statistical concept, particularly because it makes a lot of intuitive sense when you're discussing it with families. And when you think about, again, going back to the, the leeway in the guideline, you are talking about, you know, a clinician and a parent looking at an otherwise well-appearing baby who had often just one fever, and you're discussing invasive tests like lumbar punctures, you're discussing hospitalization on antibiotics. Both of these things have come with, with their own set of harms, and they both require parental consent. So, you know, you really need to have partnership between the clinician and the family in terms of making a determination of risk tolerance and risk threshold when you're making these decisions. And so I think as a clinician, this guideline does provide you with some numbers that you can use um, in how you communicate with families. So the number needed to treat is essentially the inverse or the reciprocal of risk. So when you're comparing two groups, it's the inverse of your absolute risk reduction. So you know, if the risk in group A is X percent and the risk in group Y is Y percent, subtract that, that gives you the absolute risk reduction and the inverse of that gives you um, your number needed to treat. Um, where it's The way it's used here, it's based on prevalence. A lot of the risks that are calculated are based on prevalence. So roughly, you're, if, one, if there's a 1% risk of your infant who looks just like this with this particular profile to have bacteremia, the inverse of that is 100. So you would need to admit 100 infants on IV antibiotics to rule out one case of bacteremia. So that is kind of the general concept of number needed to treat. And I think it I think it resonates with families and with clinicians in terms of making decisions. The, the place where the guideline uses it um, is in terms of determining whether to do a lumbar puncture in infants 22 to 28 days old who have normal inflammatory markers, a negative urinalysis, and are otherwise meet the low risk criteria. And Unfortunately, there's less data in in this particular age group, but even with the numbers that we have, if you have procalcitonin as one of your inflammatory markers, then you would need between 1,250, so 1,250, to 1,500 interpretable CSF samples to rule out one, one more infant with meningitis. That number is a little bit lower, but still between 1,000 and 1,200 if you don't have procalcitonin. And so I think that those numbers really help clinicians and parents to determine, if I tell you that number in a well-appearing child, you know, what is our joint shared decision-making about whether or not we're going to, we're going to tap this low risk baby 22 to 28 days old. So that's a great point because they say the word and on the flow chart quickly for those listening, inflammatory markers here, they mean a CRP greater than 20 a procalcitonin greater than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, uh, and an ANC greater than 4,000. So those are the inflammatory markers. And then, of course, temp greater than 38.5. So those four things are what they're using as inflammatory markers. And the way they say it, if you have abnormal inflammatory markers, any of them, you perform an LP. If if none of them are abnormal, they're all normal, they say may perform an LP. So, Sonia, you're saying at that point – you have a discussion with the family and you say the risk here is one in about 1,250. So I have to tap 1,250 kids this age to find one where the CSF may be positive, which to me sounds like an entire career may go and you may just get one. Now, Paul, you actually do this. Can, can, can you weigh in? Is this uh, How do you have this conversation? Yeah, so what the guideline really recommends here is a parent engagement or shared decision making around this decision in the setting of a neg- negative inflammatory markers. I think the challenge is if, if you, the subsequent recommendations are that if you, if the parent and the clinician together decide not to do a lumbar puncture, um, that the infant should be admitted to the hospital mm-hmm. off of it with or without antibiotics. If you decide to do the lumbar puncture and it, it is normal, so you do it and the CSF is normal, no pleocytosis. Um, then you do another P2 
parent engagement and shared decision around the decision to hospitalize infants. So it's a kind of a um, multiple conversation. I think the challenge is in a busy emergency department is in a, in a setting where a parent is understandably, they're worried, they may be scared, they're sleep deprived. This is a young infant who's, they've been home for three weeks um, from the hospital. Um, and so how to do this in a way in, in shared decision making, its purest form needs to be unbiased, where you have to then present equally the risk of doing a lumbar puncture, which is sometimes, you know, sort of poorly defined in terms of what the, the severe outcomes are. They're very rare. So to present sort of risks that are sort of unbiased uh, and then really sort of assess to the parent and kind of meet them where they are. Like what, what's important to them making the decision? Uh, do they have a preference? What's the clinician's preference? And to really engage the parents. I think the challenge in, in this is just that depending on the decisions that are made, there may be multiple of these conversations around multiple decision points. And in the busy emergency department, that may be challenging. Um, and so I think there has to be sort of, I think it's a, it's a good principle that the risks go low. Um, and so engaging parents is really important. Um, we have to make sure we're doing it equitably as well. We have to make sure that we are providing equitable care. So we're engaging parents of different, regardless of race, and ethnicity, the same way, regardless of language preference, the same way. Um, but we also have to sort of see how best to implement this in practice since in a busy emergency department setting to have these conversations takes time, takes energy, um, and you have to sort of make sure that you, it's done in, in a way that really engages parents in an unbiased way. Yeah, and Paul, that brings up a great point. If you decide, if you decide to not do the LP, they say may administer parenteral antimicrobials. Well, then I don't know what to do at that point as the hospitals. If I'm getting this kid, the ED did not do the LP. It's a 23 D old child, but negative inflammatory markers, and they gave her a dose and two doses of antibiotics or antibiotics. Then how? Then what do I? At that point, I can't. There's nothing I can do to tell me what's working, what's not. If I stop antibiotics, I got to watch this kid one or two days more to be certain we didn't miss anything and everything stays low. I, the, I like this the least of everything I read. Just uh, just uh, putting it all out there. I liked it. I understand why they did it because the, the evidence is, I mean, if a parent said to me, uh, honestly, if a, parent, if a hospital doctor said to me, my risk is one in 1,250, I'd probably still have them do it because I feel like my, my uh, luck isn't great. So I, I would worry about that, but that's just me. So now I think we've gotten that part down. All right, that was good. Then, 11B, clinicians should obtain CSF for analysis and, and bacterial culture, even if more than if one uh, inflammatory marker is abnormal, should start antibiotics if either CSF suggests bacterial meningitis or UA is positive. They can start antibiotics if the CSF is normal, the UA is normal, and any inflammatory marker is abnormal. You can start it. The wording changes there. Then, for 12C, which is weak evidence, you can give antibiotics even if the UA is normal, inflammatory markers are all normal, and CSF analysis is normal or enterovirus positive. So they're really giving us a lot of leeway, really do whatever we want. Just interesting, the wording. Anyone going to manage at home should get parenteral antibiotics even if inflammatory markers are normal, UA is normal, and CSF is normal. And just all over, that's my phone you're hearing in the background, which I'm not answering. Sorry, everybody. And then you can manage a patient at home. When the UA is normal, no, infl no inflammatory markers abnormal or they're all normal. CSF is normal or enterovirus positive. And then they really go into good written and verbal instructions given, including when to come back in detail to the parents. So we're cruising through. We're on 14. Then they tell you when to stop antibiotic after 24 to 36 hours. If the cultures are negative, again, same thing. Clinically well-appearing, we're improving inner infant, no other reasons for hospitalization, no other infections requiring treatment. And then they talk about uh, what we what we brought up already in terms of times for when these things grow. Number 14, some, same as above, but for home, good. Uh, 14C, treat any positive bacterial growth with target antibiotics appro appropriately. And now, we're one over an hour in, 29 to 60 day old infants. So here they start with, you should get a UA by bag or spontaneous void. This is where they talked about the lumbar um, massage or stimulated void. And only if that's positive, you get a catheterized specimen. Here, they're even more specific. They don't want you to try the cath unless the bag is positive at all. And they tell you that circumcised, uh, uh, circumcised boys will have a likelihood of UTI less than 1%. So they may be exempt from, exempt from this recommendation all the way around. 16, get a blood culture. Again, assess uh, inflammatory markers. Same description as above. They reference the description for the inflammatory markers, which we don't have time to read, but basically procalcitonin has the most evidence for, and the most sensitivity 
for helping to detect uh, IBIs or invasive bacterial inflammation. But in the studies done, it's always paired with other inflammatory markers and not alone. So at alone, you can't really use it. Uh, with everything else, it's very helpful, along with CRP more than 20. Number 18 can get CSF for analysis uh, and culture and test for enterovirus if there's, when there's pleocytosis, if any in, inflammatory marker is abnormal. And this was different. So the way the flow chart looks, you have, you get a UA, you get blood cultures, you get inflammatory markers. If any of them are abnormal, then you would get an LP. If there, none of them are abnormal, you may not perform an LP. That's new. Anyone want to, anyone want to comment on that? And, and the reason for that is we talked about the rate of bacterial meningitis getting lower as you get older. So here the point is without inflammatory markers, the, the, the odds of it being positive are very low. Is that right? That's exactly right. I think um, in this age group, the committee agreed that if you have, if you meet all the other low risk criteria in terms of your fever and inflammatory markers, uh, the risk of meningitis is low enough that an LP is not, is not recommended or, or, you know, you can do it, but again, it's not necessary. Just to add on to that, I think two pieces. So one is I think that also includes infants with a positive urinalysis. There's been a lot of literature now, retrospective, some prospective, for example, from PCARN um, as well, um, that has shown that the, a positive urinalysis alone does not increase the risk or the prevalence of meningitis amongst febrile infants. And so infants who have negative inflammatory markers, a lot of the, all the algorithms that have been used for risk stratification includes urinalysis because that, that does increase the risk of having bacteremia, but it does not it alone increase of uh, meningitis. So negative inflammatory markers, urinalysis positive, urinalysis negative, don't do the lumbar puncture. One thing I'll say though, if your inflammatory markers are positive, what the guideline actually says is may do lumbar puncture. So I would say a lot of us in practice still, I would say do it. I think, the, I think what the guideline clearly says, if you have procalcitonin, that you should use a procalcitonin based algorithm. Step by step approach is one. More recently, the PCARM prediction rule, which is highly sensitive and, and, you know, more specific than prior rules. Um, but that even if in the setting of a positive inflammatory marker, the meningitis risk is still low. And so you don't need to do the lumbar puncture. I think a lot of that is another recommendation that's really in the emergency department. If there's an infant who in that 29 and 60 day age group has a positive procalcitonin, am I likely to do the lumbar puncture? Yes. But it does, again, I think based on practice setting, based on what inflammatory markers we're using, gives you the option to not do it. Though I think that that I, it needs sort of further study in terms of infants with positive inflammatory markers and, and, and risk, especially prospective studies, um, you know, from PCARN, for example. Um, and so anyway, so that's one recommendation I think that still I am still getting my head around in terms of how I'm going to implement that. I will likely still do a, po uh, a lumbar puncture in that setting, but I think it will be interesting to see how this is implemented. Because they talk about there isn't data on inflammatory positive versus inflammatory negative infants because there's not enough meningitis to compare the two groups and say, okay, does it or does it not? Uh, and Paul, what you just said is basically uh, 18B. If all the inflammatory markers are negative, LP doesn't need to be performed, but use a prediction ruler model. So we can skip that one. And then 19A, if CSF makes you think it's bacterial meningitis, then use parenteral antimicrobial therapy. Now, here is interesting. They give so much detail on HSV, but they don't talk about what we commonly see, uh, which is your CSF shows a white blood cell count of 20. So it's outside the range of normal, even in the newer newer studies done by Joanna Thompson, which show, you know, maybe 15 is normal. You're outside the range of normal, but you're clearly not thousands to where you really think there's a bacterial infection going on. And I think everyone practices a little differently. We sometimes will just put them on parenteral antibiotics and rule the patient out for 36 hours. So they don't give you numbers that would make you say that. But I'm assuming what they're talking about is the thousands of white blood cells in the CSF, not when we get like a common 20, 25 white blood cell count. Am I right about that? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, my inkling would be anything that is um, outside the accepted category, uh, accepted um, threshold by age um, would count as pleocytosis. Um, certainly your, um, you know, the higher the number of uh, white blood cells, the, the higher your risk of meningitis. But the way I interpret these guidelines is, you know, if it is outside the normal, um, those infants are certainly um, uh, eligible for antibiotics and rule out. Okay. Paul, you agree? 
Yes, I agree. I mean, I think with the guidelines recommendation, we're going to be hopefully if implemented, uh, we'll be doing less lumbar punctures or fewer lumbar punctures, I should say, to use my proper grammar. Um, and so I think that uh, that will result in these small numbers and then hopefully even small numbers that have CSF clear cytosis. But I think there it's only appropriate, as Sonia said, to err on the side of caution. Again, for the 24 to 36 hours that the infant will be getting antibiotics, if your enterovirus comes back positive uh, before then, then you can even stop earlier. So wrapping this up, they then talk about when to use parenteral versus oral antibiotics. To summarize this as, as succinctly as I can, uh, if your inflammatory markers are abnormal, but your CSF is normal, they say you can use uh, parenteral antibiotics, I guess, to rule them out. You can use oral antibiotics if your CSF is normal, all your inflammatory markers are normal, but your UA is positive, so you're thinking UTI. And don't use antibiotics if you have a normal CSF negative UA, and all inflammatory markers are normal because they talk about the risk for a well-appearing infant with these negative findings we just talked about. Having bacteremia is 0.1% for infants 29 to 60 days of age, and that is very, very low. And then from there, they get into when to discharge, which isn't different from the 22 to 28-day-old, 22 to 28-day-old infant. So that is all three flow charts rapidly done towards the end because we ran out of time. So I'll give each of you a chance. Uh, we'll start with Sonia, then wrap up with Paul. Is there anything we did not discuss in these guidelines that we should have? And I'm sorry for the time crunch. No, I think, you know, what I would really be interested in is how these guidelines are implemented across settings. Um, and I, I think really, I imagine there's going to be institutions that adapt these guidelines and that uh, settle on kind of institutional pathways that try to standardize care a little bit because these guidelines have uh, so many different alternatives and options. But uh, what I think is really neat about these guidelines is that as a clinician, if you need to have a discussion with a family about risk, the guidelines, and particularly if you look at the key action statement boxes, um, they, they give you so pretty quick risk benefit assessments. They give you prevalence numbers for um, a risk of bacteremia or meningitis in specific groups. So I think, you know, if you look at the guideline closely, there's, there's a few opportunities um, for clinicians to kind of pick up some talking points or, or pick up talking points on the fly. And I think particularly for, for trainees and, and, and junior faculty, it's, I think it does provide a great resource to have those conversations with families. It does feel like almost a choose your own adventure from our the old books when we were growing up. Paul? Yeah, I, I agree. I was going to say um, something very similar to what uh, Sonia said very eloquently. I think that the key, I think this is all over the guideline, which is we have, this is meant for uh, providers across settings, uh, as obviously Sonia has mentioned several times. And I think it, it's a mix of risk tolerance between the clinician and the parent. I think it's really important to engage parents in some of the decision, whether it is the more gray areas of the language that says may or may not, um, really offers that sort of clinician parent dyad uh, to work together. And I say parent could be a legal guardian and certainly um, um, in that setting. But uh, so I think it will be, I think how we do that in different settings um, is going to be interesting to see. I think it'll be interesting to see how this guideline is kind of implemented uh, going forward in the clinic, um, so in the emergency department, in inpatient setting. And I think similar to how the guideline was constructed, and all credit to the authors for doing a very comprehensive job, but also working together in a multidisciplinary fashion. I think it's what's going to be similar too, is in your own practice network, having all the stakeholders involved and sort of making these pathways and, and, and how to best implement them will be important. Yeah, I will say, even in this conversation, what I have appreciated that the authors did, which I guess I did not appreciate as much, is how different practice settings are going to have different resources and how different they could be. So the fact that they gave you all of that wiggle room is helpful for where you work. Well, Paul, Sonia, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. I took extra time than I said I was going to take. I appreciate your patience. Thank you both very much. Thank you, thank you so much. And for our listeners, please make sure to get the free CME from University of Pittsburgh. Thank you again to our guests. Time for our acknowledgments. I want to thank our special guest again. I really do appreciate your time. I want to, as always, thank the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and specifically the Paul C. Gaffney Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine for continuing to support the podcast. I want to take the time to remind our listeners that there is CME associated with most of our podcast episodes courtesy of the University of Pittsburgh. So thank you, University of Pittsburgh. Please just click on the link at the bottom of the podcast, take you to a web page, create a free username and password, answer some questions that I write that are not hard, and that's it. You get AMA Category 1 CME credit. 
I want to, as always, thank and acknowledge Dr. Megan Keene Tarchichi, who helps me with everything. But I really want to thank you all who are listening. Thank you for letting me uh, come into your earbuds or your car, wherever it is you are. I really appreciate the fact that you do that. Uh, If there's anything you want to hear or think we can cover better, any comments, suggestions, compliments, whatever you want to do, again, as always, please feel free to email me at Tony, T-O-N-Y, dot Tarchichi, T-A-R-C-H-I-C-H-I, at C-H-P dot E-D-U. Thank you again, everybody. I hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening.